In, in her 2015 Time 100 tribute to Hillary Clinton, Lorene Powell Jobs wrote, when she's standing up for the rights of women and girls, she's speaking not only of gender, but also of justice and liberty. As Hillary Rodham Clinton has always made clear, these values are universal values, and fulfilling them for her and for really all of us is, is not only a practical pursuit, but a moral pursuit. We also may talk a little about politics. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to welcome Hillary Rodham Clinton. You're wearing time red. Is that what it is? Well, maybe not. Happy, I'm a happy little colorblind. To. Happy to, right. Um, thanks, thanks for being here. Um, uh, I want to start in the news. Um, you were... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, were, you were on the stage uh, at the Women in the World Summit 10 mm -hmm. days ago, uh, and you said, we deserve to see the Mueller report. Right. Right. We've, we've seen it, or, or most of it. Right, right. Um, what, you know, what, what well, I, start with the second sentence. Let me read you the second sentence. I, mean, you, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it. The Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in a sweeping and systematic fashion. Right. Second sentence. Yeah, well, that is the main story, and it's a story that uh, needs to be uh, told and retold over and over again because we were the subject of a foreign adversary's attack, an attack on our election, an attack on our sovereignty, uh, an attack on our democracy. And you can try to figure out everything that did happen and we're a long way from knowing because we need to get the full report, the unredacted version, uh, and certainly the Congress deserves to get it. But I think it's fair to say uh, that this is not just about a reckoning with the recent past. This is about what is going on today and the threats to our next election, uh, to our defense as uh, a nation. So Edward, I think the report is long and it obviously takes time to wade through it, but especially for uh, this group, it's something that every American who cares about uh, holding our adversaries accountable, looking to prevent what happened from ever happening again, should take the time to go through. Uh, and I'm really of the mind that um, the Mueller report is part of the beginning. It's not the end. Uh, maybe, as Churchill famously said, is the end of the beginning, uh, because there's still so much more that we should know and that we should act upon. And obviously, that's uh, what the Congress is trying to figure out what to do right now. G given the very thin margin in some pivotal states, do you think, knowing what we know now, Russian interference may have swayed the election? Well, let me say what I believe to be one of the best analyses of the uh, election done by Kathleen Hall Jamison, the uh, very authoritative expert on elections at the University of Pennsylvania who uh, came out with her book, um, Cyber War, that studied both the social media attack and the hacking and weaponization of stolen material. And it's her, in, it's her conclusion that it did affect the outcome. And, I think it's pretty hard to argue against that because it was such a uh, full-throated attack that was uh, aimed at uh, propagandizing people, dividing our country, creating uh, all kinds of disruptions from phony protests and demonstrations uh, to all kinds of agents and bots acting uh, as though they were uh, Americans debating politics. Uh, so I think that if you piece all of it together, um, what was the polling information given to the Russians, what was done with the hacking of the uh, DNC, not the emails, but the uh, information stored in the cloud 
about persuadable, targeted voters. You, you just begin to piece it all together, and I think Professor Jameson uh, reached the right conclusion that it certainly had an impact. Um, to what extent? It's hard to tell because we haven't really investigated that. Nobody is truly uh, digging into exactly what happened in a number of states um, on the day of the election. And just the last thing I'll say is just recently, the government, our government, uh, finally acknowledged that the Russians were in the county election systems of every county in Florida. And, you know, I don't have time, you don't have time to go through every piece of information that has now been uh, verified as to what was done and then try to uh, come up with um, uh, reasonable, fact-based uh, conclusions from that. Is there any part of you that's tempted for a rematch? <laughs> well, look. <laughs> uh, what I want is for the country and the Congress and the press to come to grips with what did happen and not to get diverted and distracted by an effort to either move on or diminish uh, the impact of this attack. Um, and so I have a, a kind of weird personal history uh, about impeachment. Um, and uh, not, you know, and not what you're thinking because... Um, Watergate, right? <laughs> yeah, because I was actually a very, very young staff attorney on the Nixon impeachment inquiry back in 1974. And it took several years for the slow acquisition and then uh, publication of information to show the level of corruption and obstruction that was existing uh, in that White House. And there was a special counsel, there was a select committee in the Senate, and then there was this impeachment inquiry that operated totally behind closed doors, kind of similar to the way that Mueller operated in a as nonpartisan, professional uh, fashion as anything I've ever been part of. And I started to work there on, in January of 1974. And we worked 18, 20 hour days compiling evidence. We didn't have computers. Um, we didn't have you know, a lot of the um, opportunity to really gather information and analyze it from 10 different ways. We did it a really slow, old fashioned way of compiling fact after fact after fact. And by the end of it, the evidence was overwhelming that the president had committed high crimes and misdemeanors. And I was one of the young lawyers who actually drafted the memo about what is a high crime and misdemeanor. And it was truly meant by our founders to describe actions that undermined the integrity of our government, that placed the personal or political interests of a president over the interests of the nation. Uh, and in so doing, um, we were able to make a case that was accepted uh, by the Judiciary Committee that then voted out articles of impeachment on a bipartisan basis. So I, I know what it looks like and I know what is required to do it in a way that wins the trust and confidence, not only of the Congress, but of the American people. Uh, but I certainly think that uh, the roadmap, as some call it, of the Mueller report raises so many serious questions. In part one, about what the Russians did, which is beyond debate. And in part two, about all of the evidence of obstruction. I, I want to ask you about the other experience with impeachment, because um, you wrote, in our current issue, the tribute to Nancy Pelosi, whom we'll hear from a little bit later. And one of the things you said about her is that she's holding the line against the Trump administration uh, right now in Washington. She has said it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Impeachment is not worth it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, I think everybody would like to know whether you agree and whether the Mueller report has shifted your views at all on that. Well, I think what Nancy means, and I agree with what she means is that it shouldn't be a preordained conclusion. It shouldn't be what you do for partisan political purposes, almost 
outside the framework of the Constitution. It should be something undertaken in a really serious, diligent way based on evidence, not on partisan advantage. And so what she's now putting in place, I think, addresses that. As I understand it, there will be many more public hearings uh, at which people who have a role, like they did in 1974, uh, came forward. I mean, the, the witnesses in 1974 were, and 73 and 74, were predominantly administration witnesses. They were John Dean, who happened to be White House counsel. So it's fully appropriate for this Congress to call Don McCann, who happens to be, or happened to be, White House counsel, and you go down the line. And what I think her argument is, you know, we want to show the American people we take our constitutional responsibilities seriously. And I agree with that absolutely. So you don't put impeachment on the table as the only item on the table and say you're going to get there no matter what, which is it's what happened in 99. Instead, you say, we are going to proceed with the seriousness that this demands. And the House Judiciary Committee, if there is a sufficient, careful analysis of what's in the Mueller report and what's coming to light through congressional uh, hearings, may well start an impeachment inquiry whose responsibility is not to prejudge the outcome, but to examine the evidence as objectively as possible, and then to draw conclusions. And if at that point they believe that high crimes and misdemeanors have been committed, then I think it is the obligation of the Congress to put forward articles of impeachment. And I think Nancy understands that kind of sweep and the care that has to be taken so that it doesn't immediately look as though you've got some uh, pre-ordained outcome that you're aiming to get without doing the hard work uh, that I remember so well from my experience all those years ago. And Bill Clinton's popularity rose significantly during impeachment. Is that, you think, part of what's on her mind, that if you do this without the proper process, the politics of it trump the constitutional issues? Well, Edward, remember, there was not one substantive hearing, not one. Everybody knew this was nothing but a political, um, partisan effort. In fact, Erskine Bowles, who some of you may know, who was the White House Chief of Staff, after the Democrats actually gained seats in 1998, uh, he went to visit uh, then Speaker Gingrich and said, you know, this doesn't meet the constitutional requirements. Uh, obviously, this was a terrible personal uh, mistake. Uh, but it certainly doesn't rise to impeachment. So what are you going to do? And Gingrich's response was, we're going to go forward. And Bowles said, but why? And his response was, because we can. So from the beginning, nobody, even the ones who were prosecuting the case, believed that this was on the level. So I think Nancy is right to be cautious about making sure whatever is done in this Congress is more in accord with the very careful approach uh, of 1973 and 4. And remember, the other piece of this is the Congress also has to keep working. And I know she is very focused on putting some accomplishments on the table, even if they die in the do-nothing Senate, which they will because that has become a hotbed of cynicism unlike anything I have ever seen. And I served there for eight years, and I know some of these people, and they know better. So the House needs to put some you know, points on the board, and that happened during Watergate. Significant pieces of legislation were passed in 73-74. The War Powers Act, uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the Federal Highway Trust Fund. So the Congress kept working. They actually could do two important things at once. And that has to be the goal here. Uh, because otherwise, what you're saying is, we were attacked. We have significant evidence that this administration did everything it could to undermine and interfere with the investigation into that attack. 
and we are going to walk away and pretend it didn't happen? Well, at that point, then you might as well just say all bets are off. There is no accountability for anyone in the most significant job in the world. So, and I don't think that's the right place to end up. You could go through this process that I'm describing and at the end of it say, you know, there's a lot of smoke, but there's not enough fire. We're not gonna proceed. Or we've gotten only this far, we can't get any further. I'm not prejudging it. I think we can definitely say we know what happened with the Russians um, and we know what they were doing to us. And look, on the night of the election, in the report, there's uh, a, uh, a message that was sent uh, to Putin congratulating him because he had won. And that is certainly how the Kremlin viewed this. They had won. So we know that. We need to keep making sure people understand what happened and try to prevent it from happening again, which is my main goal, and then explore the second part of the report. I want to get to, to 2020 and some other subjects also, but um, uh, before leaving Mueller, you're a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, did Donald Trump obstruct justice as you read the incidences as Mueller lays them out? Well, I think there's enough there that any other person who had um, engaged in those acts uh, would certainly uh, have been indicted. But because of the, uh, the rule in the Justice Department that you can't indict a sitting president, uh, the whole matter of obstruction was very directly uh, sent to the Congress. I mean, if you read that part of the report, it could not be clearer. I mean, I, you know, as I read it, basically what I thought it was saying is, look, we think he obstructed justice. Here are 11 examples of why we think he obstructed justice, but we're under the control of the Justice Department and their rule is you can't indict, but we do have checks and balances in America and there is this thing called the Congress. I mean, you could not be more explicit than please look at this, you may look at it and conclude it doesn't rise to an impeachable offense. That's your job, but I'm giving this to you. You, you mentioned um, Newt Gingrich saying, because we can, um, and I, I want to ask you um, about the, 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 the future, all the anger and, and division in the country, which is, of course, a two-way street. Um, uh, you have to wonder, if, if any time we have a, a president and, and a Senate of different parties, can we ever get a Supreme Court justice through again? Um, well, that's a first question. Well, even I was shocked by the brazen um, disregard of uh, precedent and constitutional duty when it came to Merrick Garland. I, I was stunned that um, McConnell would not even entertain giving this highly distinguished jurist um, when there was a year left in President Obama's term, uh, the kind of uh, hearing and respect that he deserved. So here's the problem, Edward. You know, everybody would like to see more comedy. I hear that word all the time. Let's have more comedy. Let's have more. With a T, not a D, right? With a T, right. yeah. Well, we've got a lot of the D, so we need more of the T. Um, <laughs> And to look for ways to you know, engage people and have them uh, start to work together across party lines. And I think, though, you, voters hold the ultimate uh, power here. Don't reward people in public office who refuse to seek common ground or to follow precedent or to respect the rule of law. Um, and I think that in the absence of voters saying, you know, on the one hand, we really don't like this behavior, but on the other hand, I'm going to keep rewarding it. I'm not sure that we can come to a point where we break this uh, deadlock that we're currently experiencing. And that, you know, look, I, as I say, I, when I was in the Senate, um, we had partisanship, of course, and we had hard fought conflict over all kinds of issues. But we also did pass legislation. We had regular, what's called regular order, where committees would meet and 
you know, mark up legislation and try to figure out how to you know, take into account people's many uh, different uh, interests. So I've seen it work and it's not working now because one party has basically decided that it's in their political partisan interests uh, to shut the process down unless they get exactly what they want. But you've also got, I mean, right, it's a two, it's a two way, it's a two way street comedy. Um, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren muttering about the 25th Amendment, invoking the 25th Amendment. The, our uh, Time columnist, David French, wrote recently about the Steele dossier, D D DNC, funded in part by your campaign, obviously went a ways beyond or where or you've said, beyond what your campaign intended. But there's a lot of discord and nonsense and, and untruths out there from both sides, right? I mean, it's not just, it's not just the right. Let me say I think it's asymmetrical warfare. <laughs> I think that the right is historically and certainly recently much better funded and better organized and much more ruthless and relentless in the pursuit of their political ends. It doesn't mean that there aren't individual Democrats and we don't have you know, hotly debated arguments over what we should or shouldn't do. Of course, that's the case. But I, you know, I know that there's this, always this desire to say, well, on the one hand this and on the other hand that, the both sidesism, where, you know, they're not good, but you know, you're not so good either. I am exhibit A of that, and so I understand that completely. But I think any fair analysis of the very uh, heavily uh, supported agenda of the right at this moment in time. And it's not only financially supported, it's ideologically supported, it's religiously supported. It would be doing a great disservice to the realistic view about what it will take to try to get back to some, um, you know, some balance, which I, I am certainly in favor of. I mean, I disagree with a lot of the views on the other side. I disagree with views on my own side, but what I would, value is a return to um, civil, smart, fact-based debate and an effort to try to work through our differences, you know, to make decisions that will improve or better uh, the lives of people. I don't think that's a lot to ask, but right now it's a really difficult uh, goal to achieve. Um, should somebody who doesn't identify with capitalism be the Democratic candidate in 2020? Is that an issue? Well, look, I think we're gonna have this debate. We are having this debate. Um, but this was part of the debate in the primary back in 2016, uh, when I was you know, saying, you know, I defended uh, capitalism, but well-regulated capitalism, democratic capitalism, not predatory capitalism, not capitalism that is free of any kind of check and balance. So I think the debate can't just be uh, a this or that. You have to say, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's the greatest uh, you know, generator of jobs and opportunity, uh, and we need to figure out how it doesn't uh, consume itself and our democracy. Uh, so my view has always been a well-regulated capitalist system is good in the long run for capitalists, for citizens, for communities. I would like to see us move away from the shareholder uh, mania that became the definition of capitalism starting in the 60s and 70s and then accelerating to more of a stakeholder version of capitalism. Remember, corporations are the creation of society, of communities and countries. In this, our, our country, states that create these uh, organizations that enable people to uh, create products and services and maximize their potential and make a profit and employ people. But we've gotten to a kind of, uh, perverse point where a lot of the opposition and understandable opposition to capitalism is rooted in the way it is operating now to the disservice of the community at large, of the employees, of even suppliers and others. And 
you see this great discontent spreading across um, certainly the West, uh, and China will have their time eventually as well. Because if people feel that wealth is concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, and there are fewer and fewer checks and balances, what can they do other than you know, basically rise up? And they can rise up in the streets of Paris, or they can rise up in the Brexit vote, or they can rise up in our country because they don't have a lot of other options to express themselves against what they see as an economic system that has gotten way out of balance. So I think that there will be this debate, and I hope it's not a cartoon debate. Um, you know, I hope those of us who defend well-regulated democratic capitalism, you know, come to the table, make the case, uh, and make the argument that those who are, you know, really worried and anxious and young people who feel like, well, what has it done for me lately? You know, I don't see it helping me. I don't, I can't get a good job. I don't see my, my future in this kind of an economy. We'll understand that we've been living to some extent with a distortion and we've got to get back to uh, the way the economy should work where we really do have inclusive prosperity and people do rise and they don't get bottlenecked and feel like all their hard work and their efforts are no longer rewarded. We, we have a red light flashing, but I'm going to invoke executive privilege. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I have one more question, and then I want to let people in the audience um, ask some questions. There's a slide um, that, if you can get that up on the screen. Um, the folks at Northeastern University's journalism school are doing an ongoing analysis of the way candidates are covered. And you can't, we can't see it exactly from where we are, but the gist of it is they're measuring positive and negative words used about candidates. And the most positive words used are for Sanders, Beto, somebody else, Biden. Uh, and then as you go down the scale, it's, it's, Booker, Booker. oh, it's Booker, sorry. Thank you, I can't see. Um, what, what advice do you have? We have more women running in the Democratic primary than ever. What's, what's your advice to them? Right, well, I wrote a book called What Happened? <laughs> and a paperback, which added to uh, the arguments that I make. And I have a chapter called Women in Politics. And I address the you know, very real way that I was covered and the way I was treated um, online in real life. Uh, and I say, look, you know, whatever responsibility I should take for it, I take for it. But beyond that, there is something else at work. And at the time I wrote the book, it was, um, you know, spring of uh, 2017. And I was already seeing the way that people like Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren were being treated. You know, I never saw anybody shut down on the floor of the Senate the way Mitch McConnell shut down Elizabeth Warren and basically told her to stop talking in the midst of a debate about whether Jeff Sessions should be attorney general. And she was reading a letter from Coretta Scott King that Coretta had sent years before against Sessions becoming a federal judge because of his, um, his views and his actions. And Mitch McConnell went out there and basically shut her down. Then I saw Kamala at a hearing cross-examining Jeff Sessions, as she should. She was a member of the committee. That was her responsibility. And I saw the chairman gavel her into silence. And I saw example after example after example. Because, you know, after Elizabeth was forced to leave the floor of the Senate, a really good guy, I think it was Jeff Merkley, Senator from Oregon, he walked out and he finished reading the letter. And McConnell didn't say a word. Now, you can be a little paranoid about this, or you can say, you know, there is something going on that we need to pay attention to. And I, I saw a study like that, don't know if it's the same one, and I wish I could say I was shocked. You know, because all during 2016, online, there were people who say, well, you know, I sure would vote for a woman, just not that woman. 
And now all of a sudden, some of those women they said they would support, they're running and, oh, I'm not voting for that woman. Now, part of the problem is that I still don't think, I mean, I think people don't understand unconscious bias. And I want to give Mark Benioff a big shout out because I remember, When Mark was challenged about whether or not Salesforce paid men and women equally based on experience and education and achievement, he said, well, of course we do. But he was humble enough to say, let's look. And they looked, and what did they find? They found discriminatory actions being taken on promotion and on salary and bonus and the like. And a few other companies were brave enough to um, follow Mark's example. Time is will, doing a study. Yeah, time. Well, now that you're we in the are. Mark family, that's good. Mark and Lynn keeps them, you know, keeps them honest about all this. Um, <laughs> so, what what I would say is, it, there is outright nasty sexism and misogyny. Go online sometime and read comments uh, in response to activist women or elected women. Pick your choice. But a lot of it is unconscious. You know, people who could pass a lie detector test saying, well, I'm not biased. How, how dare you say I'm biased? I know I'm not biased. But then all of a sudden, you listen to the conversation. A man is assertive. A woman is aggressive. A man is forceful. A woman is shrill. You go down the list. And about the worst thing you can say is that a woman is ambitious. Well. We know we live with, almost embedded in our DNA, thousands and thousands of years about expectations and how people are supposed to behave. I mean, the president has just nominated, you know, Steve Forbes to be on the Federal Reserve. And people are now going through a lot of what he has said. Women should not play sports. Women don't belong in, you know, business decisions. So. This is alive and well, and I think uh, and a publication like Time has an opportunity to really call people out, but also to try to educate people about well, it. Well, since it sounds like you won't be going to the Forbes Summit, uh, we, hope <laughs> we, we hope you'll come back next year. Um, I, I, why don't we take uh, one audience question, because um, we're really short of time in the front row right here. Hi. Hi, I'm Dylan. Hi Dylan. Can we get a mic? Here comes a mic, Dylan. Great. Thank you. So I am in law school right now, um, and we, a lot of us here are emerging leaders and want to do things like run for office or do some incredible things, but we're crippled with student debt, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of candidates have been coming out with plans on what the best way to handle student debt is, and I was wondering what you think the best solution to this would be. Well, I think there are a number of good solutions. I offered some in 2016. There's a, a bunch of good ones coming forth in this uh, electoral cycle. I think here's the goals we should try to achieve, Dylan. Number one, we should make college as cheap as possible for the maximum number of students because what we're doing now is pricing kids out of education. And we're pricing them. You know, and not, not only out of you know, well-named schools like you know, Harvard or Yale or whatever, we're pricing them out of state schools you know, because states have so dramatically cut their investment in higher education. It used to be you could go to a great state school in California or New York and you could afford it and you wouldn't go deeply into debt. We have got to reverse that and I applaud Governor Cuomo in this state for what he's tried to do with the state schools to get the cost down. Secondly, we have this huge debt overlay that it's not only bad for the individual who carries that debt thinking that he or she did the right thing. I got my education at a place that I thought would really be good for me, and now I have this huge debt. And I think that it's also important for the economy to release that money. So some kind of forgiveness program. Um, I know some of the candidates are coming out with them. I think we could have a, a really good, smart conversation about what's the best way to do that. I also think we ought to move toward a system where you pay your loan back. We did a little bit of this, but then it kind of got 
ignored and, and uh, dismantled, you pay your loan back as a percentage of your income. Because when I graduated from Yale Law School, I had a ton of loan debt. I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund. I think I made, I don't know, $15,000 a year. My husband went to work as a law professor in Arkansas. He made about, I don't know, twelve dollars or $13,000 a year. But we had signed up for a program that paid our loan back as a percentage of our income. So it was affordable. We didn't have a flat amount that we had to meet no matter what our uh, pay scale was. So we could actually take jobs that we wanted to take as opposed to feeling like we had to take a job in order to pay back our debt, which is kind of backwards if you think about it. So there's a lot we can do, um, and I would, um, I would recommend moving on a, a bunch of different fronts at one time. But right now, we have an unsustainable economic problem that is really impoverishing uh, or at least diminishing the economic prospects of too many young people who feel like they can't you know, move on in life. And that's bad for society as well as being really a terrible burden for individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. We're It, 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 uh, it feels like a good time to transition to talking about food. So uh, next up is Chef Jose Andres and Martha Stewart. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Thanks, guys. You. <laughs>